Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Secret Service Man Fatally Shoots Self Outside White House A man fatally shot himself outside the White House on Saturday, according to the Secret Service, sending the building into lockdown following reports of shots fired near the North Lawn. In a statement, the Secret Service said a white male approached the vicinity of the North White House fence and fired several rounds just before noon. At this time, the Secret Service does not believe any of the shots were directed at the White House. No others were injured during the incident. The name of the deceased is being withheld until his family can be notified. President Donald Trump, who is in Palm Beach, Florida, has been made aware of the incident, White House spokesman Hogan Gidley said. Gidley referred all questions to the Secret Service. Trump and First Lady Melania Trump are set to return to Washington on Saturday night. NBC White House correspondent Jeff Bennett wrote on Twitter that reporters were being told to shelter in place in the White House briefing room. Breaking, we're sheltering in place at the White House briefing room. A report of shots fired near North Lawn, per a U.S. Secret Service agent. Trying to learn more, Bennett wrote on Twitter. The statement added that Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police will lead the investigation with support from the Secret Service and other law enforcement agencies. Putin claims he can't respond to Mueller's charges if those involved didn't violate Russian law. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Friday the Kremlin can't respond to charges that Russian nationals meddled in the 2016 president election if those involved did not violate Russian laws. Putin said during an, an interview with NBC News Megyn Kelly that he cannot know whether Russian law was violated and would need to first see what they've done. You have to understand what it takes is an official request to the general prosecutor of the Russian Federation. Putin said of taking action on those that were indicted. Give us a document, give us an official request. Thirteen Russian nationals and three Russian entities were indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller last month with an illegal information warfare scheme to disrupt the 2016 presidential election and assist Donald Trump. Kelly said that Putin said the same thing when she last interviewed him in June 2017 before the latest indictments. Putin contended that he cannot take action unless it goes through official channels, not through the press or yelling and hollering in the United States Congress. Putin has previously denied that Russia tried to influence the 2016 election. Trump attacks terrible actor Alec Baldwin in typo laden tweet. President Donald Trump lashed out Friday morning at Alec Baldwin, the actor who has famously played him on NBC's Saturday Night Live since the fall of 2016, writing online in a typo-laden post that watching his performances was agony for audiences. Alex Baldwin, whose dying mediocre career was saved by his impersonation of me on SNL, now says playing DJT was agony for him, the president wrote online. Alex. It was also agony for those who were forced to watch. You were terrible. Bring back Daryl Hammond, much funnier and a far greater talent. Trump soon after deleted that tweet and replaced it with one that corrected the typos and slightly changed the language. Baldwin, in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter previewing his forthcoming talk show on ABC, did indeed say portraying Trump has become agony and that he plans to dedicate himself to opposing the president in the upcoming elections. If things don't go in the right direction for the midterms, I could go out on the street, stand on any corner and tap ten people on the shoulder. And all ten of them, in all likelihood, would be more qualified, ethically, morally, intellectually and spiritually, than Trump. I'll vote for Mitt Romney. I don't care. Anybody over the sky. It doesn't matter. We have to get rid of him. And that's another project I'm working on, the famously liberal Baldwin continued.
my wife and I agreed that we are gonna give it everything we have. And then if, God forbid, he wins again in 2020, I'm wondering can I host a game show in Spain? On Friday, the actor tweeted his response to the president. Baldwin's impersonation of Trump, received as a revelation when he debuted it on the first episode of SNL's 2016-17 season, portrays the president as meaner and more incompetent than crafty and sometimes slimy impersonation of longtime SNL cast member Daryl Hammond, who played Trump on the show for years. Hammond has said in interviews that he was devastated to have been replaced as Trump. In addition to serving as a regular SNL host and presidential impressionist, Baldwin has earned two Emmy Awards and three Golden Globes. He was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 2003. And while the president has complained of late about his treatment on SNL, he has previously said that he is a fan of the show. The president, then a GOP primary candidate, hosted the show in November 2015. Trump's tariff plan pushes NAFTA talks to the brink. Mexico City, President Donald Trump's decision to unilaterally slap tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum has upended the NAFTA renegotiation and threatens to derail talks that were already politically and economically sensitive for all three countries. Canadian, Mexican and U.S. government officials and industry representatives, gathered here for the seventh negotiating round were sent scrambling when Trump announced plans to levy tariffs of 25% on steel imports and 10% on aluminum imports to protect U.S. national security interests. While negotiators have continued to meet, the tone has changed as Canadian and Mexican representatives try to figure out the impact on their countries and whether their leaders will retaliate if Trump doesn't backtrack. Why are we signing a trade deal with a country that would unilaterally decide to restrict certain sectors? said Jorge Guajardo, a former Mexican ambassador to China who now works as a senior director at McLarty Associates in Washington. Since the announcement, negotiators have been just going through the motions, that's it, Jerry Diaz, president of Canada's largest labor union, UNIFR, told Politico on the sidelines of the talks on Friday. This is the United States' plan to schoolyard bully. This is the United States saying, listen, the trade agreement is going to be based on our rules, or there's not going to be a trade agreement at all, Diaz said. It's best for us to just understand that up front and walk away. Others closely involved in or following the talks downplayed the idea the tariffs would lead any country to withdraw from the agreement, but there is consensus that Trump's play will make an already contentious negotiation only more difficult. The U.S. has put forward proposals on issues including dispute settlement government procurement and automotive rules of origin that its NAFTA partners have found unworkable, and now they are even less likely to find reason to compromise. Once it becomes political, you have to have a winner, you have to have a loser, and that just makes it more difficult, Duajardo said. Both Canada and Mexico, which together account for about 90 percent of U.S. steel exports, hold out hope they might be carved out of the final tariff decision which the White House is expected to finalize sometime next week. But Trump has offered no indication there will be any exemptions. Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland vowed on Thursday to take responsive measures, if Canada is affected, calling any restrictions against imports absolutely unacceptable. At the same time, Mexico has said it will consider all its options if it is targeted including potentially taking safeguard action under Section 201 of the Trade Act of 1974. Mexico, in particular, has been careful not to make any official declarations or threats until Trump acts. The hope in all three countries is that Trump will take to heart the widespread backlash from businesses, trading partners and Republicans in Congress and soften or narrow his course. Optimistic views that the tariff news and fallout could remain separate from the talks are tempered by the fact that steel and aluminum are central to some industries that were already in the spotlight in the NAFTA renegotiation. Autos, for example, have emerged as one of the thorniest policy issues, and talks on rules of origin could now be deeply affected by the forthcoming tariffs. 
it's difficult to argue that the potential Section 232 implications are on a separate track than the NAFTA auto rules renegotiations because steel and aluminum are the core materials in automotive assembly, said Flavio Volpe, president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, a Canadian auto group. If the White House chooses to proceed without excluding Canada, it is unclear how USTR can credibly move good faith negotiations forward at the same pace. And even as the White House maintains that it's got nothing to do with NAFTA, as Trump trade adviser Peter Navarro said Friday, frantic chatter about what the tariffs will look like and the effect they could have on the negotiations continue to course throughout the halls of the Camino Real, the hotel here where officials are meeting. The looming storm clouds on steel and aluminum are a serious risk to world trade and to the NAFTA negotiations, Peter Clark, a Canadian international trade strategist, wrote in a column on Friday. The expected announcement could, if it includes undeserving victims, begin a long and bitter trade war, he continued, adding, nobody wins a trade war.